Welcome to this video on the power and limitations of theories of human behavior. I've been teaching in the University of Minnesota's master's program in human resources and industrial relations for 25 years. One of the things that makes our program one of the very best is that we don't just teach HR practices. We root thinking about HR strategies and HR practices in underlying disciplines like economics, psychology, and sociology, which can help managers develop a much deeper understanding about human behavior. Why do we do this? Well, managers and organizations want workers to do certain things and not do certain things. So we're in a better position to try to figure out how to shape those behaviors if we have a better understanding of the drivers of human behavior. Economics, psychology, and sociology all have important things to teach us about what drives human behavior. So there's a lot of power to applying the insights that we derive from these disciplines. However, there's also a significant limitation, a significant danger. Each of these paradigms is built on a very specific set of assumptions. If those assumptions don't match your workforce, then the lessons that you pull out will be wrong. You should not be um, applying things from a discipline when the assumptions of those discipline do not match the nature of your workforce. So don't try to force square pegs into round holes. So let's first look at economics. In the previous modules, we've developed a number of insights that come from economic theorizing. We've looked at concerns with workers loafing or shirking. We've looked at problems of maybe financial incentives being too strong and pushing workers to exert too much effort or effort in substandard ways. We've looked at concerns with workers pursuing their own goals, not organizational goals, which we called opportunism. And so this yields implications for the need for monitoring, for incentives, or maybe even financial penalties to try to prevent workers from doing certain things that the organization doesn't want them to do. We also saw how this raises issues of workers not really cooperating or giving full effort in teams. It also may cause workers to use private information in very strategic ways. And economic analysis also reminds us of the importance of market alternatives for both workers and organizations. Now, these insights are important, but I want to emphasize that they don't just come out of the blue. They come from a very specific set of assumptions. And so to remind you of these assumptions, economic analysis is rooted in assumptions that agents are self-interested, they're rational, they're driven by external rewards like money, work is lousy, so you just endure it to reap those extrinsic rewards that individuals want, and also markets are important. So again, these insights don't come out of the blue, they come from these assumptions. So therefore, these assumptions will um, drive whether or not you should be applying these insights in your particular work group or not. So in other words, there's a number of dangers that will arise if you mistakenly apply these insights. Now again, I want to be clear, I'm not saying that these are the dangers of ignoring economics. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. These are the dangers to an organization, to a manager, if you apply economic insights when you really shouldn't be because the assumptions don't fit your workers. So what might happen if you apply these economic insights when your workers aren't completely self-interested and not just focused on extrinsic rewards and maybe looking for fulfillment from their work? Well, you might crowd out intrinsic motivation. Um, you might create a lack of fairness, a lack of trust, a lack of autonomy. You'll overlook the fact that social norms are an important influence on behavior. You'll devise the wrong solutions for problems with effective work teams. You'll look at information skeptically because you'll be assuming that people are uh, using it strategically when in fact they're not. And you might place too much reliance on, mar on markets. Similarly, let's look at psychology. We've seen a number of important insights that come from applying psychology to the workplace looked at the importance of intrinsic motivation, We've looked at importance, the importance of individuals seeking positive self-esteem, wanting to feel good about themselves. We've looked at the importance of autonomy and belonging and a sense of mastery for intrinsic motivation and positive self-esteem. 
And we've also looked at how fairness can have a lot of different dimensions. But just like with economic thinking, these insights don't come out of the blue. They're rooted in specific assumptions. And so to remind you of these assumptions, it's that individuals have a desire for psychological well-being and they're self-motivated to pursue that psychological well-being. But they face cognitive limitations as they try to make complex decisions. They have individual differences like personality differences and also implicitly assuming that work can provide fulfillment. It's not just a lousy activity pursued to earn income. So there's dangers, again, of applying these insights if these assumptions don't fit your workforce. So for example, maybe your workers are self-interested. Um, maybe they really are interested more in money than in intrinsic rewards. And if that's the case and you apply these psychological insights, things could go wrong, things could go bad in your work group. Maybe workers will shirk because you're trying to motivate them intrinsically, but they're actually extrinsically motivated. Um, there'll be problems potentially with worker opportunism. You'll have inadequate monitoring and incentives. You'll identify the wrong solutions for problems with effective work teams. You'll treat information as true um, and as transparent when workers are actually being strategic with the information that they're revealing or choosing not to reveal. And you might underappreciate and overlook the importance of social norms and markets in shaping behaviors. So again, there's dangers from applying these insights. So lastly, sociology. It's the same idea as with in economics and in psychology. So there's a number of important insights for managers and organizations that come from sociological um, intellectual work. There's insights that highlight the importance of status as a driver of human behavior, importance of how workers identify with an in-group and disassociate themselves from an out-group Sociological thinking highlights the importance of peer pressure and other normative pressures. The role of culture, the importance of reciprocity in individual behavior, the importance of getting group dynamics correct. And also sociological thinking highlights the importance of social networks. But these insights come from a different set of assumptions. What are the assumptions that yield these insights? Well, it's that workers are socially aware and they have a desire for status and social acceptance and they want to avoid social exclusion. Sociology assumes that work is a social activity and shaped by norms and other social institutions. And instead of being competitive, sociologists typically assume that markets are hierarchical. So if you apply these assumptions, sorry, if you apply these insights, when these assumptions aren't valid characterizations of your workers, Maybe your workers are more interested in their own intrinsic or extrinsic goals and they're not as interested in what other people think about them. Then things can go poorly in your work group. So what are some of the dangers? Again, might miss the fact that if workers are extrinsically motivated, they'll be shirking concerns, concerns with opportunism. So you might end up with both inadequate extrinsic or intrinsic motivation if you're overlooking both of those. You might overlook the importance of fairness overemphasize culture, and also come up with the incorrect solutions to problems of team effectiveness. So in conclusion, economics, psychology, and sociology are particularly relevant to understanding work-related behavior. And so therefore, it can be very beneficial for managers to understand the insights that these disciplines can teach us. But it's important to remember that each is focused on a particular set of assumptions. If these assumptions don't fit your workers, then it's dangerous to apply the insights. This is true for all managerial strategies. Think about the assumptions behind any piece of advice you get. Now, I've been emphasizing insights from academic disciplines here. After all, I'm an academic. But don't think that the advice you get from consultants, trade magazines, blogs, or other non-academic sources don't have these same problems. Those pieces of advice are ultimately rooted in assumptions about human behavior as well. The difference between me and them? I'm trying to make this clear. So, whenever you're considering any type of piece of advice, think about your workers through the lens of what assumptions underlie this advice. When you look at your workers through this lens, do you see workers who are self-interested and primarily interested in optimizing their own benefits, especially around money? Or do you see workers who are concerned more with self-esteem and fairness who can be intrinsically motivated? 
Or do you see workers who are concerned with belonging and status and pay attention to social norms and other social pressures? Right, so this can be very important for thinking about whether the assumptions of economics, psychology, or sociology match your workforce or not. So you need to figure out what your workers are like and don't try to force the issue. Don't try to fit square pegs into round holes by forcing policies that don't fit your work unit.